Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Fainoff. I'm the President and Chief Technology Officer here at Biosurfaces. We'd like to welcome you to our webcast that addresses one of the most important areas that Biosurfaces has been working on, which is hemodialysis access. And we've assembled a group of experts in different areas with the goal of providing you an overall picture of why hemodialysis is needed, what happens when things go wrong, what Biosurfaces is working on uh, to improve access, and what the future may hold. I would like to introduce our, our panelists for this discussion. Dr. Yael Vin is a general surgeon who is an assistant professor of surgery at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Since 2008, Yale's primary focus is on creating and treating access options within patients afflicted with end-stage kidney disease. Yale also has a master's of, public, uh, master's of degree in, in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health as a result of her interest in clinical research in the field. Dr. Nikhil Agrawal, an interventional nephrologist, is an instructor of medicine at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Nikhil's primary focus centers around treating issues that arise from problems with access grafts, such as blockage or infection. Dr. Mauricio Contreras, a plastic surgeon by training, is an instructor of surgery uh, in the Division of Vascular Surgery Research at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, Mauricio's primary focus over the past 31 years is research centered around evaluating mechanisms on why access grafts and prosthetic grafts in general fail and working to develop new types of access and vascular graft devices. Uh, to provide you some background on myself, I'm a biochemist by training, uh, but over that time, I've learned a lot about medical uh, materials that are used for these types of devices. Uh, for the past 30 years, I've been working on developing biomaterial technology that could be applied uh, to new access grafts. I started in the vascular surgery research uh, laboratory uh, with Mauricio uh, some 30 years ago uh, under the guidance of Dr. Frank Legerfo, looking at the causes of why grafts fail and then using that knowledge, uh, I started the uh, biosurfaces in 2003. Been fortunate to have the opportunity to work with these great people as many others along the way uh, with, this, uh, with the goal of, of improving hemodialysis access for patients. So I'm excited about this webcast, this is our first webcast. So let's get started. And my first question is going to go out to Yale. Uh, can you tell our viewers a little, bit of, uh, a little bit about the background about what hemodialysis access is and why is it needed? So um, hi, um, happy to be here. So in order for patients to be able to connect to a dialysis machine, we need to create a closed circuit that can e um, either deliver that can deliver blood at high flows from the patient to the machine and from the mach machine back to the patient. And the way to achieve this is either with a dialysis catheter, which is basically like a very large IV that is placed in a large vein. Um, this option carries many risks of, for infections and other problems, um, but is a, certainly a solution when dialysis is needed urgently or to bridge the patient until there's a better access. Alternatively, the better ways are to try to create a conduit, which is basically a tube uh, between the artery and a, and a vein. And this could be using the patient's own vein, and that's called a fistula, or using um, a pre-produced tube, which is the graft. Um, this conduit, this tube has high flows, and it allows us to place two needles in it, two large needles, one aspirating the blood to the machine and the other returning it. Fistulas, although they're all natural, they require the patients to have good large veins to work and not all of them become functional. And it takes many months for a fistula to be ready for use. Grafts, on the other hand, they have a very high success rate and can be used early, but being a foreign body, they develop later problems and they require more maintenance to keep them working. So really the search for, for a graft that would have um, um, less long-term problems has been an ongoing quest for the dialysis access community. That's great information. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I've always sort of viewed vascular surgery as sort of us being sort of high-tech plumbers. And so what, is, what do you think in terms of, you know, it sounds like you treat quite a bit of, of the plumbing problem. So what is, what is the, the toughest job, part of your job as a surgeon dealing with these access graphs? Well, I think for every access surgeon, the toughest part is, is the failure of an access or the complications. Uh, unfortunately, dialysis access, even in the best of hands and with appropriate decision making, we can't make every access work and we cannot el eliminate every complication. And this is really frustrating for the surgeon, but more so even for the patient. 
And I feel the hardship that that puts on the patients and their families when we find ourselves in these situations. Yeah, it's definitely a, a, it's a problem that we saw a lot. Uh, I know you see it on a daily basis in terms of on the research side, seeing it from the patient's perspective when we've gone to different meetings in terms of how they deal with it. Can you talk a little bit, uh, tell our, our audience a little bit about how you actually create an access? You know, it sounds like it's a very simple thing, but it really is not, it, it's simple, but not so simple. It takes a lot of training and a lot of experience. Can you just talk a little bit about how you would create an access in a patient? Sure. So th this is done in the, in the operating room, of course. Uh, most access surgery is done as day surgery. We usually uh, use a regional block. So the arm that we're working on is completely numb. And the patient also gets sedation. And this is just to say that no one should fear that they would be uncomfortable during this procedure. And then to create a, a graft specifically, we expose the target vein and the, tar and the art artery that will supply the blood. And we take the graft and using a tunnel or device, basically a metal tube, we pull it through. So it's positioned under the skin between the artery and the vein. We then occlude the flow in the vein to make, and we make an, a little opening in the vein and we suture the graft, the tube to the vein. And we repeat this on the arterial side. And this way at the end, we have a, a tube that connects flow from the artery to the vein. And you can actually easily feel it under the skin so that you can, um, place needles into it. And what type of, you know, what type of, you know, we talk about this tubular construct, but what type of tubes do you usually work with? Are they made of synthetics? Are they made of tissue? Like what types do you usually use in your clinical setting? So both are available to us. And, um, you know, the, there's no data to support that one graft will do better long-term than, than the other. So it is based on surgeon preference, but there are biologic grafts, that, and then there are synthetic grafts, um, and, and we use both. And since we're talking about synthetic grafts, what would be something that you would view as a benefit to using, you know, an artificial graft that you can just pull off the shelf made of synthetic materials that you see as an advantage of, of using that type of material? So, so again, the, the synthetic grafts have been, is, they're sort of the, the gold standard. We've been using them um, since the 70s for dialysis access. Um, they're easy to use. As you said, they're off the shelf. Um, they're reliable. They're easy to feel. The nurses of the unit are very comfortable cannulating, meaning putting the needles in these things. They, there's a tactile sense to that, and, and, they, and they do very well with these grafts because they're used to them. And then we have newer synthetic grafts that actually allow us to use the grafts um, very early on. They're call, called early cannulation grafts. It can be used even um, you know, the next day after, after we create the graft. And so, and so what complications, you talked about a little bit about this a little bit, but what complications do you see um, in terms of using these types of devices, whether it be biologic or synthetic, and you know what will lead us you know segue into the keel in a second but what complications do you see and how does that how do those complications affect the patients so, um so again you know the most common common complications with grafts is what happens um after the graft was created the graft most of the grafts will work but then within one year more than half of the grafts will require interventions to keep them working so what happens is there's this foreign body that connects to a vein and the vein sees the foreign body and responds to it. It's, and it closes off on that connection between the graft and the vein. Um, and, and this will cause problems with dialysis. It will sometimes cause the grafts to actually clot and we have to go in and reopen them. And that would be the most common problem with any kind of grafts, the biological ones and the synthetic ones. Excellent. I, I think that's a great, uh... Um, discussion to bring Nikhil into. So Nikhil, can you talk a little bit uh, and tell the group, uh, the audience, what an inter interventional nephrologist is and what your typical day entails dealing with these types of complications? Sure, uh, happy to be here as well. So interventional nephrologist, as the name suggests, is a nephrologist who does interventions or procedures and uh, specifically uh, dialysis access procedures. Okay. So the surgeons create these accesses, yeah. fistulas or grafts, and uh, 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 interventional uh, nephrologists uh, try to maintain these uh, accesses and grafts uh, because they develop so many problems. So to give you some perspective on how common the problem is with these fistulas and grafts, the whole field of interventional nephrology exists because of these problems. Uh, 
a tip on a typical day i see uh, patients for routine follow ups because i'm trying to catch problems before they become a bigger problem and then i also uh, uh, intervene on these problems um, and try to solve them uh, using uh, balloons to open up the narrowings in these uh, accesses stents again to keep the narrowings open uh, take the clots out from these narrowings and so on and so forth that's uh, an ex excellent background in terms of what your day entails um, you know, in general, can you give me an idea or a sense of what, how many patients are afflicted with end-stage kidney disease uh, and how many of people, you know, roughly will require interventions uh, in terms of cre an access creation? Uh, so in the U.S., there's about 750,000 patients who have what we call end-stage kidney disease, which is kidney disease requiring dialysis or transplant. And about half a million of them are on dialysis. The other 200,000 or so are on transplant. So these half a million dialysis patients, they all require some kind of access. Now, not all of them are on hemodialysis, but vast majority of them are. Uh, so all these patients require accesses. And this population continues to grow because there's about 120,000 patients who develop end-stage kidney disease every year. Uh, the reason this population is not grown to millions is because the outcomes in these patients is so bad that unfortunately they don't live too long. But this population nonetheless continues to grow and uh, continues to require access because without access, they cannot get dialysis. There's no way to do dialysis without access. That's excellent background. And I think, you know, for, uh, for some of the audience, you know, it, it, you know, to give them some perspective on this, it is one of the only uh, disease states that it's, that's fully covered uh, by the federal government. You know, you have cardiac disease and cancers and other types of diseases, but, you know, dialysis and end-stage kidney disease specifically is one of the only uh, diseases that are covered due to the severity, as you mentioned, in terms of how many people are afflicted with it. Um, and so in terms of yeah. creating better devices and that don't have those complications, that is definitely yeah. a need. And unfortunately, uh, this disease affects minority population uh, more so uh, than the other populations. Um, and although this disease only affects 1% of Medicare population, it ends up consuming 7% of Medicare budget because of the extensive cost associated with not just dialysis, but access and everything else that comes with it. That's excellent. And so and you, you, you touched a little bit about what you do in terms of you know, using a balloon um, to sort of flush out an access, open it up a little bit. Can you just expand on that just a little bit in terms of you know, how is the patient, you know, is it a day procedure, is it an overnight procedure? Uh, just touch a little bit more about the process itself to let people know what that entails. And, and actually, and let me just add to that. How does that inter? How does your doing your job um, require you to interact with Yale as the surgeon who's implanting uh, this type of access graft? Right. So, what happens is that these patients have these grafts or fistula, and they're getting dialysis. So now, some of the times, the dialysis unit is able to identify that there's something wrong with the fistula or the graft. They're not getting enough blood flows or the pressure is too high or the patient is bleeding too much and then they refer them to us. Sometimes uh, what happens is that we see them for follow-up and on ultrasound or on a physical exam we notice that there's something wrong with the graft. Other times it ends up that the patient goes for dialysis and then they see that the fistula and graft is totally not working, it's clotted and then they refer it to us kind of like an urgent or emergent procedure to open it up. So through all these ways, the patients end up coming to us for this, uh, for these procedures, which is a day procedure. Uh, they get some Very sedation nice to keep them comfortable. And we have a lot of tools and techniques to uh, fix these. None of them are perfect and none of them have very high success rate, especially in long term. Uh, but nonetheless, we have these balloons which we put in into these grafts and fistulas to open up the narrowings. Uh, we have stents to keep them open. We have devices to take the clot out, medications to dissolve the clot. Uh, and then the patient uh, goes home or back to their dialysis unit after these procedures. Excellent. In, uh, in terms of, 
you know, you know, your interaction with Yale, and, and that's how I first met you was through, you know, my, my interaction with Yale. How did you both get to me and, and why is it important for, you know, I, I've noticed this through uh, different interactions with the surgeons that I come in contact with, that they always have a very good uh, relationship with their interventional nephrologist. And I, and I think that partnership seems to be really important as I've seen in different areas. And can you just talk a little bit about that? So, so Yale is kind of unique because she's not just a surgeon. She also does all the interventional nephrology uh, procedures and happens to be my mentor. Uh, but broadly speaking, uh, the surgeons create these accesses and the interventional nephrologists maintain them and keep them open and keep them going. Uh, so they both need each other uh, because if the surgeon doesn't do a good job, then my life is hell. And if I don't do a good job, then the surgeon's accesses <laughs> fail. So it's very important to have a close relationship. It, uh, so there are some problems that I can solve that the surgeons cannot. There are other problems that I'm too scared to solve and then I go to the surgeons. So it's absolutely necessary and critical to have a close relationship with the surgeons uh, every day. Excellent. Thank you so much. And at uh, this, uh, this time, I'll bring Mauricio into the conversation. So Mauricio, you, as you know, you know, these vascular graphs that the surgeons and the nephrologists, interventional nephrologists are dealing with have been used clinically for over, you know, 60 years. And I, and I know, you know, from personal experience, you've been involved with looking at why graphs fail and looking at new technologies of over 30 of those years, about half the time not to make us feel old, because I'm part of that 30 years, but half of our uh, half of the time the graphs have been in existence, we've been looking at why these graphs fail and what can we make new ones. How did you get into this area uh, when you first started? Well, first of all, I, I was pretty much sort of like amazed by one of my teachers in medical school, a, a surgeon um, that actually perform microsurgical procedures. And I was pretty much fascinated with the concept that there was nothing available um, for vascular reconstruction um, that the FDA um, had approved. And so you would have to harvest a small, you know, vascular segment of vascular vein in order to do, you know, bypass reconstruction. And so anything under five millimeters of diameter would be considered, you know, such, such a graph that has not been approved by the FDA. And, and then again, watching him do procedures in the um, experimental lab with uh, small animals, it was just the microvascular surgery aspect of it that really, really um, intrigued me. And uh, working with the microscope, uh, it, it was actually kind of like my start. And then an interest in trying to develop that, just a vascular graph that could be of a small diameter that could be, you know, easy to use and be able to replace, you know, uh, seg segments of arterial uh, circulation that would be impaired. And for instance, in coronary artery, um, in a plaque, uh, atheros atherosclerosis plaque, you, you don't have actually anything that would be considered synthetic or um, off the shelf that you could use. So primarily you would either have to go to um, a vein from the patient that you would have to harvest um, or a thoracic um, artery that you could sort of like use as well. And these procedures are time consuming and sometimes you have a patient population where these are not available. So that would be the gold standard for coronary artery bypass, but um, for prosthetics, there's, there's nothing. So that's why I became interested pretty much in, in this area. That's excellent background. And, and what are, you know, some of the, over your time, what are the, the, some of the major issues or complications that you've seen uh, with these type of prosthetic graphs? Well, I think that Yale and uh, Nikhil pretty much sort of like describe it, right? So the, the graft is placed in, and then you had either two sets of, of failures, acute either because of a thrombus formation, and you have to sort of like perform a thrombectomy and you know take away the, the clot in some instances. But the late failure in many of the grafts, it, it's a different mechanism. And that is because at the site where you are joining the arterios end to the uh, graft or the venous end to the graft, you have what is called um, animal hyperplasia. There's proliferation of cells 
that just keep going and narrow you, the outflow or the inflow of your um, bypass. And that pretty much sort of like over time decreases the lumen and the, the amount of blood that can go through the graft. And that's when you have to sort of like, you know, go back and, and repair. These procedures are not uh, procedures that you could do when you have, for instance, clot in an artery where you can use the catheter and you do the thrombectomy and you remove it. Um, this, this narrowing is actually um, constituted or, or formed by um, a great deal amount of sort of like, you know, cells that have sort of like decreased or compromised your, your lumen. So in the time that you've been in research, uh, have you seen any progress made into these, you know, these areas such as intimal hypoplasia? If, is anything really translated uh, that what you've seen on the bench top to clinical? Yes, I mean, it, it's been very interesting. I mean, the, the process, because you see people working in the lab trying to come up with different modalities or different therapies that if they could sort of like apply them with this sort of like, you know, change, you know, the, the life of the graft and, and, you know, prevent some of these complications from, you know, endothelial cell seeding into the graft in the OR, which just extended the life of the, of the graft a little bit more for just a few months. But it was not really um, a procedure that was followed up because it was just too labor intensive and, and expensive and, and complicated. And, and then again, the results were not, you know, that great. And then you have uh, companies that are pretty much interested in improving the their graphs that they have available, and they either coated the luminal surface with, you know, anti-thrombotic agents such as, you know, heparin or others that would prevent these deposition of sort of like, well, initially clot, but also of these cells that you don't want to sort of like um, be um, or continue to proliferate. And what has happened is that when that uh, coating that is on the lumen of the graft, it's exhausted, then all these different sort of like issues of healing starts sort of like happening. So you delay, you gain some time, but you don't solve the problem. So further along, there's been uh, a lot of interest and Dr. Jekyll's lab has been interested in trying to look at what genes and are triggered and play a role in this um, in the hypoplasia uh, process and trying to sort of like see if knocking down some of these genes um, while before you sort of like implant uh, a venous graft would have an impact. And uh, along the way of, of, of silencing RNA and, and doing different things, uh, I think people have tried to improve um, patency, long-term patency of the grafts but not with a great success, as you, as you can sort of like see from Yael and Nikhil's comments that, you know, they have to intervene. Well, you know, with all these different uh, attempts at, you know, trying different technologies and things like that, what keeps you engaged in this area? You know, you, 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 know, you and I have both been in this area for a while in terms of on the research side. So what keeps you fired up about, you know, staying, staying in this space that there hasn't been a lot of success? Well, like you said, I mean, it's 30 years of sort of like, you know, investing, you know, uh, in, in this and trying to understand the mechanisms why grass fail, but also intervention. How can you, you know, prevent or, you know, come up with a better uh, prosthetic or bioengineered, uh, you know, conduit or uh, va synthetic vascular uh, device that could sort of like improve the quality of the life of these patients. Nikhil um, mentioned, you know, how these, these patients end stage, for instance, for dialysis access, um, the, their quality of life, I mean, having to go and have these procedures done, you know, three times a week, um, it's, it's um, you know, the, the quality of life of, of patients is, is difficult. And so if you could improve, um, you know, their, their quality of life and, and that of others, um, it's not just vascular access for dialysis. I mean, then there, you have the whole spectrum of patients who suffer from heart disease or peripheral, you know, vascular uh, disease and, you know, in them as well. Uh, so it, it's always the patient that drives you, um, your, your interest in sort of like improving their, their quality of life and 
it's a great satisfaction to be able to sort of like do that. And, and, I, and I think, you know, I, we, I think we all share that sentiment. I think that we all put the patient first. I think in, you know, even as a company, you know, being as a, you know, as a business, my first thought has always been about the patient as well as you as, as Yale and the and the Keel as well, is that ultimately at the end of the day, we're trying to do something that will help these patients deal with this disease, which is a really tough disease. And I think one thing that was important when uh, biosurfaces uh, began to develop this technology, as you and, and Yale and the Keel well know, is we want to make sure that all the stakeholders uh, were you know, incorporated into this process, whether it be the surgeon, uh, the interventional nephrologist, all the way through the technicians who are placing needles um, into the patients, and most importantly, the patients themselves, uh, because ultimately, they are going to be the most effective if this graft is a success, a graft is a success or and or a failure. And so for many years, you know, as you know, in, in, in Dr. LaDriffle's lab, we were trying to develop um, technology using existing graphs and trying to modify that surface and see what that brought uh, to the table. And unfortunately, um, it was pretty hard to modify these type of graphs because, you know, you were limited in what you could do uh, in terms of cha really changing the paradigm. Unfortunately, you know, what you see with these synthetic graphs is uh, a process that, as Yael pointed out, they stay open for a period of time. And then as you mentioned, and Nikhil mentioned, the body catches up to them, figures out that something's not right and makes changes. And eventually they have a high rate of failure. And so we really thought about this process and really led me to think about how do we re rethink the total process? Um, you know, could we, you know, add uh, specific properties to the material um, that would allow it to heal better? Um, and the healing part of it, I think, is the biggest part, right? I think that most of the current materials that are out there do not have the cellular ingrowth and the ability to act like the normal body tissue. And I think that, for me, in, in my 30 years of running my head into the wall, uh, really struck me is that ultimately, when you look at Teflon and you look at these other graphs, that you're not getting the full sense of healing. And that led us um, uh, to... Uh, the process of uh, looking at electrospinning. And electrospinning is really the process of taking uh, a, a solution of material. And so basically, if you take your, your material that your shirt is made out of, for example, making it into a solution, and then applying a voltage across it. And that voltage creates very small fibers that resemble the fibers that are used in your body in terms of the size of that. And that really led us to think about if we can create something that the body cells in terms of the structure uh, like to grow into, then we think we could have something there. And that's really what we started uh, our process related to the new spun vascular graft. And uh, our graft, I'm gonna show you a short animation about our graft. And just to give you an overview of what electrospinning is, how it could affect the patient. So I'm gonna play that for you right now. Biosurfaces has developed the next generation vascular access graft called New Spun Vascular Graft. This graft is formed using its Biospun technology. Biospun materials are made using a proprietary electrospinning process in which high voltage is applied to a polymer solution, creating a narrow polymer jet which rapidly accelerates towards the nearest grounded surface. The result is an integrated complex mesh of fibers that are about 50 times thinner than a human hair that structurally mimics the body's natural tissue scaffold and encourages the body's cells to grow into the device. Many different types of simple and complex structures can be made. Optionally, drugs can be directly added into the fiber, resulting in targeted therapeutic effect. The new spun vascular graft is durable and flexible can easily be sutured to the artery and vein, and can self-heal around access needle puncture sites and suture needle sites used to connect the graft, preventing bleeding. In preclinical studies, cells have been shown to migrate into the material and form a smooth surface with minimal rejection and clot formation, indicating that the vascular graft integrates into the surrounding tissue, which may result in positive clinical outcomes. 
reducing the number of hospital visits and reoperations. The new spun vascular graft can also be used for other applications such as peripheral bypass and implantable heart devices. So as you can see, this technology has a lot of promise in that it allows us to create specific types of devices as well as the ability to localize properties such as, as Mauricio had pointed out, some companies look at immobilizing or putting a, a protein on a surface. This allows us to actually incorporate the drug right into each fiber and allows it to distribute the drug uh, across um, a specific targeted surface. And that's what really uh, gets us excited about the technology of all the versatility of the technology. Um, this technology uh, that we showed in this video was one of the um, award winners uh, for the Kidney X uh, phase one uh, competition uh, that actually we're looking to develop new types of devices that would uh, provide a better effect uh, for the patients that are undergoing access. Um, we are excited to keep this work, uh, continue this work. The group that you see here on the screen is charged with uh, really excited about bringing this technology forward. And you know, our goal in this case uh, for this graft is we want cells to grow in certain parts, but we also want to control cell growth where we, as, as, uh, as Nikhil and, and Mauricio pointed out, where we have cell overgrowth, we want to control that as well. And this type of device allows us to do that. Just to give you an overview of where we're at with our new spun vascular graft, uh, we've conducted extensive benchtop and preclinical assessment uh, on a non-drug loaded version of this, of this graft, and the, and, the, and the data looks promising. But that being said, we still have a lot of work to do to bring this technology further along before um, it will make it into the clinic. And we have you know, a good team in place, as you can see, uh, with the folks that I, we're working with on, on, on our screen. Uh, but one thing I'd like to do before we close, is I want to ask each of the panelists uh, their personal thoughts about the new spun vascular graft in terms of what is appealing to them in their respective space and what they hope uh, that this graft will bring in terms of success uh, down the road. And as I mentioned, again, we have more work to do, uh, but just sort of as an early indicator of what, what their thoughts are. So we'll start with Yael. Uh, you can provide us your thoughts, that'd be great. Well, we, we talked before about the fact that there are different graphs that, um, that we are using already in the market. Each one of them has um, provides certain benefits over the other graphs, uh, but none of them um, are to be perfect. I, you know, again, I think perfect is hard to achieve, but I think that the, the new spun graft offers many of the benefits that we can get from different grafts separately, all together in one graft. Um, one, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a, a early cannulation graft. This is a syn synthetic graft that is, you know, it, it will maintain its, um, shape and its structure um, in, um, and it will, it's a safe safe thing to use and it, will, it, it can be used early and maybe it can prevent some of those long-term complications. So again, it may be a graft that will provide many benefits that we see in other grafts all in one. Great, thanks. Thanks, Yael. Nikhil, your thoughts? I'll just say that the, the current state of affairs in dialysis access is totally unacceptable. Dialysis access remains the Achilles heel of dialysis patients. And despite all the procedures, all the discomfort uh, to the patients and their families and the billions of dollars spent on dialysis access by healthcare, uh, it's just unacceptable. What excites me about this new spun graft is that it's disruptive in its biological and physical properties and tries to target all the major problems that we have with, with dialysis access, but still maintains that familiarity with, with the current accesses, uh, which might help in uh, speeding up its adaptability by the surgeons uh, and the interventionalists and the patients and the dialysis nurses and the technicians uh, if it is successful. Great, thank you. Mauricio? Yes, I mean, just like uh, Yael and Akil just mentioned, I think combining all the best, you know, attributes or qualities that any given graft could have all in one is really what we need. And I think what's really unique and exciting about your electrospawn material is that these nanofibers 
serve as a scaffold for the cells to be able to sort of like adhere and be perhaps more friendly for the healing to occur when you establish a vascular network where the where the cells that are you know migrating in can support and sustain themselves because of it and then in addition you add either factors when you are going to be creating the graft in the electrospinning process what to promote growth or proliferation of the cells that you want and perhaps inhibition of the cells that you don't want to proliferate. So having that ability to be able to create while you're making the, the graft, it's, it's huge. And I don't think that there is anything in the market right now that would have a combination of all those things. And so like yeah, I'll mention um, in her statement, if you can combine all the good from you know the different types or different uh, modalities or technologies that are, are available, put them into one. That's really your goal. That's what you really want to do. And in the area of tissue engineering, that has really skyrocketed within the last you know ten years. The platforms are available now uh, to be able to come up with something better because, like Nikhil sort of like said, it's unacceptable that we have, you know, sort of like these kind of devices, and the the patients have to go through so much and, and suffer so much um, unnecessarily. So it's it's time to come up with sort of like a better alternative. That's great, and I appreciate all of your your, your comments. Uh, on, on this, this topic, because it is a topic to me that, you know, I agree completely with Nikhil. It's unacceptable when you're looking at over 60 years of work in this space, and we're still seeing and providing, you know, folks like Yael a really not the best uh, types of treatment that they have, they would have access to, they would have, you know, potential to use. I think, you know, sadly that We've, you know, sort of allowed the status quo uh, to proceed uh, along for quite a few years. Uh, and so, you know, that's what drives me in this space is to try to bring new tools um, to people like Yale and Nikhil who are on the front lines of trying to deal with uh, patients who are afflicted with this disease. And for me, it's unacceptable as a researcher and as a scientist that we've just accepted that this is the best we've got. And I think that's what drives me into working uh, hard to bring the new spun graft with this great team uh, forward. I think for us, at the end of the day, um, as a company, you know, we, we are fighting the fight. You know, we're looking to, you know, we have to not only, you know, tr keep our patient in mind, but we also have to look at funding and trying to get, you know, companies engaged that would be willing to help bring this forward uh, in terms of, you know, bringing the technology forward through funding. And that's always a challenge that we face, that everybody faces in the science community. Um, but also, you know, effectively when, when these type of devices may not make billions of dollars, but could help, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And so, again, we have a lot of obstacles to and hurdles to overcome. But I believe that the group we have is really positioned to work hard uh, and have the right frame of mind that the patient uh, is first and that we will bring this forward because of the patient. So, you know, I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank uh, everyone here uh, for speaking with us today and hopefully providing our audience uh, a good overview of what access is, um, what is needed uh, in the field, what happens when things go wrong, and what we at Biosurfaces and our collaborators in this space are working to do to bring uh, potentially better technology in the near future. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to make a suggestion about a future webcast topics, you know, please feel free to reach out uh, to me at info at biosurfaces.us or to learn more, please visit our website at www.biosurfaces.us and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and until next time, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.